Good morning, Palm Vista. Good morning. It's great to have you here this morning. Uh, I'm excited to introduce a brand new sermon series this morning in the Gospel of John. Um, so if you would, go ahead and open your Bibles and start finding the Gospel of John. Um, our new series is entitled, The Eternal God with Dusty Feet. The Eternal God with Dusty Feet. The Gospel of John is Jesus' invitation to life. John's Gospel, um, if you're not familiar, is one of four accounts of the life and ministry of Jesus. Uh, the other three, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, are called the Synoptic Gospels. Uh, but John's is a little bit different. John gives us a little different perspective on Jesus' life. He shares stories that the others don't. They all share a lot of language where John's is very unique. Um, and John, he gives us the most clear and most forceful view of Jesus as the eternal God in human flesh, the creator of the universe, walking the dusty roads of Jerusalem with his disciples. In today's text in John 1, 1 through 18, we have what is the overture of the Gospel of John. If you know, uh, like musical theater, which I didn't know anything about until I married my wife, and we went to all kinds of plays, uh, the very first song in a musical theater, often while everything's getting set up, is what's called an overture, and the overture plays all the different motifs and themes that are going to be developed through the entirety of that musical theater performance. And in this text, uh, John is introducing all the major themes and motifs that are going to develop over the next 21 chapters of his gospel. And so as we work through the text, we'll be seeing some of those, but they're really going to come alive as we work our way through this gospel in the months to come. The thesis of this morning's text and, and the major theme that we're going to focus on today is this, that the eternal God took on flesh to give new life. The eternal God took on flesh to give new life. In our text, John's going to introduce us to this Jesus, this Jesus who created the world, who came in the flesh and invites us to believe in him and receive new life. So if you would, turn with me as we read John chapter 1, verses 1 through 18. This is the word of the Lord. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. Light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light, the true light which gives light to everyone who is coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own. His own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor the will of flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory, glory as the only son from the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness about him and cried out, this was he of whom I said, he who comes after me ranks before me because he was before me. For from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the only God, who is at his Father's side. He has made him known. Let's pray. Lord, thank you that you have made yourself known to us. Thank you that you have sent your Son, holy, eternal God, that you have come in the flesh that we might see you and know you and draw near to you and have our broken intimacy with you restored through the blood of Jesus. 
I pray this morning that you would open our eyes to see you in your glory, to see you in your beauty, to see you in your goodness, in your grandeur, in your grace, like never before. Open your word to your people, we pray this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. So last month, if you're a nerd like me, you probably have heard about this. Last month, uh, we got the first stunning pictures back uh, of the images of deep space from the James Webb Telescope. Right, Sam? You probably looked at those carefully. Um, the James Webb Telescope, if you're not familiar, it's a state-of-the-art telescope. It's been decades in design and manufacture. It's been traveling for many, uh, many, many months and is now in orbit around the sun taking uh, some of the best photographs we have of deep space. The first image that we got back, it covers an area of sky. Uh, if you were to take a grain of sand and put it on your finger and hold it out from your face, the amount of sky that's covered by that grain of sand is the size of the photo that he took. Right? So this, that's the amount of space that it observed. And in that one uh, tiny speck of the sky, James Webb Telescope observed, listen to this, 25,000 galaxies. Galaxies. In each galaxy, you've got somewhere from 100 to 400 billion stars. And there are planets around those stars. And so you have 25,000 galaxies, each with hundreds of billions of stars. And that's just a grain of sand in the sky. The magnitude of God's creation is unfathomable. I can't even say the word unfathomable. The universe as we know it, it's, it's beyond comprehension. And John, in, in our gospel, he opens us opens it by telling us that the Jesus that we're about to meet, this Jesus is the eternal God who made and holds every one of those billions upon billions upon billions of stars in the sky. All three of the other gospel writers start Jesus' ministry somewhere in his genealogy, talking about his birth, his family tree, but not John. John starts the ministry of Jesus Back at creation. Look in verse 1. He says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Verse 3 says, All things were made through him. Without him was not anything made that was made. That's the start of Jesus' ministry. This word, the Word, or logos, it's it's a common word, common in Greek thought at the time for this impersonal force that was existing before all things, that created things, but it had no body or being. In Jewish thought, it was used throughout the Old Testament to speak of God's active work in creating, in revealing, in saving his people. And for uh, the Jewish audience that largely was the, the object of John's writing, they would have heard in John's first words here, in the beginning was the word, the opening of Genesis 1-1. Genesis 1-1, the beginning of our Bibles. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. John wants us to observe Jesus, that this Jesus, the word, is the same creator God who was the beginning. Aside from Jewish thought, the word wasn't just God's activity. The word is God. Jesus, the Jesus that we know, existed before any star burned in the cosmos. He existed before there was any atom in any planet anywhere in the billions of galaxies that are out there. All of them owe their existence to him. This is important because it's only the one God, the God who is before all things, the God who created all things, the God who designed you, only that one God is the one who can take the penalty for your sins. In every relationship, human relationship, or relationship with the divine being, uh, when there is a break in that relationship because of sin, when someone has wronged the other person, one of the two people has to suffer to restore that relationship. We know this in our own lives. If, if my coworker, my child, my spouse wrongs me, um, say I left my Chipotle in the fridge and I marked it clearly, and you come back the next day and it's missing, or you come by for lunch perhaps, stomach grumbling and the chipotle is gone, and you know who ate it. Someone has to pay, right? Either with the dark, angry looks I give that person for the rest of the day, 
or maybe I eat their lunch tomorrow, and for good measure, maybe the next day as well. Or I'm going to absorb that offense. For that relationship to be reconciled, either they're going to suffer, I'm going to make them pay, or I'm going to take it on myself and release them from the responsibility to pay me back. Release them from the guilt that I'm going to pour on them. Release them from the uh, payback that I could put upon them so that I would feel assuaged that our relationship was restored. And for us, with God, we have all sinned against God. We have all broken the relationship with our cosmic creator. And that, that sin is on a magnificent scale. It's a cosmic scale, the scale of the billions of stars of the universe. And so we either spend eternity trying and failing to ever be able to pay back that debt, or God himself must be the one who comes to absorb the penalty for our sin. So for Jesus' sacrifice to be accepted, for the cross to be sufficient, Jesus must himself be the one and only God of creation who made you and whose creation of you puts demands on your life that you've broken. But John also makes it clear that this Jesus is distinct from God the Father. He is the God of all creation, but there's a distinction between him and the Father. He says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. The Word was God, and he was in the beginning with God. If you're new to Christianity, this speaks of what we call the Trinity. One God and three persons. We have one God and Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It's a central doctrine to Christianity. It's one of the things that sets the Christian God apart from every other God that's out there. And it's incredibly important, incredibly important to us as Christians because only a God in three persons is a God who can be eternally loving. This is one of the amazing implications of the Trinity that our God, before there ever was anyone to love, loved in himself. He was a God in three persons before there was creation. There's this idea that well, God made people because he was lonely and he needed someone to love. God made humans because he needs some way to show his love and affection. God didn't need to make humans to show his love and affection. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, one God and three persons existed in eternity past for all of creation, loving and being loved. These twin truths have always been a part of God, always one, always in three persons, always pouring out his abundant love and mercy and kindness upon each person of the Trinity. And this continuity of character, this continuity of the gracious character of God is one of the key themes that John plays in our text. Notice this twice in verses 14 and 17. John speaks about Jesus being full of grace and truth. Jesus, full of grace. And truth, this is, many of the commentators agree, a reference, a reference to Exodus 34. Exodus 34 is the text where God reveals himself to Moses. He tells Moses his name and passes before him. Listen to how God reveals himself. When he first speaks his name to Moses, this is what the Lord, the God of the Old Testament says. Exodus 34, 6. The Lord passed before him, that's Moses, and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord. What does he say after that? A God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. Merciful and gracious. That word faithfulness could also be translated truth. He's a God of graciousness and truth. This is who God always has been. You understand there's not a God of the Old Testament who's old and cranky and kind of angry all the time. And then there's the God of the New Testament with Jesus who's really nice and kind. No, Jesus has always been a part of the Trinity, which means God has always been Christ-like. God has always had a Jesus-like disposition. He has always been merciful, always been gracious, and that's always been his display of himself to his people. And that's exactly what John is saying here. Look in verse 16. He says, For him, from his fullness, that's Jesus, we have all received grace upon grace, or another way to put that is grace replacing grace, grace that comes and takes the place of other grace. What grace did we have first? The law. Verse 17, for the law was given through Moses. That's the first grace. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. That's the grace that comes on top of grace. God has always been a God of grace. In the law, he gave grace to his people. In Jesus, he gives us grace and truth, even more grace to us. God has always been a merciful, Christ-like God of grace because Jesus has always been God. No one has ever seen God, the only God, who is at the Father's side, 
he has made him known. In Jesus, we see what God is like. That word made him known, you'll like this, Gerard, is the word exegesis. It's the Greek where we get the word exegesis from. So Jesus is the exegesis of God. Jesus is the exposing, the revealing, the proclaiming of who God is. In Jesus, we have God himself displayed for all of creation in his love, in his mercy, in his kindness, in his generosity. It's Jesus, the unseen, eternal, gracious God of creation in the flesh. If, if the law was, you know, my, uh, my son has this little toy scout telescope that he got, and like you can see like two stars with it, but you know, you can see a little something. Uh, if the law is the toy telescope that shows a faint image of the sky, Jesus is the James Webb, peering deep into deep space, showing us more magnificently than we could imagine the character of the eternal God that's always been. He's always been a God of grace and truth. He's always been a God of steadfast love and faithfulness. He's always been a saving, merciful God. Because he's always been Jesus. Always. I think often we hold back from coming to God with our burdens. We hold back from coming to the Father with our brokenness, with our sin, with our frustrations. Um, because we think of him as this kind of grumpy, with big bushy. I was furrowed, uh, frowning at us kind of God. That's never been our God. Our God is always and is today a merciful, gracious God, a creator who loves and delights in his people, even though we're a hot mess. (laughs) He is the eternal God. Jesus is the eternal God. The eternal God, point two, took on flesh. The eternal God took on flesh. Um, my younger kids, uh, they all sleep with nightlights in their rooms. Um, I did when I was a kid. I was terrible. I, I was I had terrified of the dark. Always had to have the door cracked to the room. Always a nightlight on. Um, and when there's a really bad nightmare, uh, they'll call out and one of us will come in. And uh, if it's really bad and they're scared, we'll switch on the lights. We turn on the lights. Um, you know, the light shines all over the room and the corners and that that shadow on the wall that looked like a, a creepy guy now goes away, and you can see it's just, a, it's just a reflection from something. And we usually go through with our kids, and we'll say, your house is safe, my room is safe, my bed is safe, and I'm safe. And we'll walk through that and help them to see the reality of what's around them. They, they were having this nightmare. There was, there was darkness. There were shadows, and, and it was kind of scary. But now that the light's on, they see what's really around them. They see that where they really are. They see that their father is really with them. They see that their room is actually quite a safe place. And these, these, shout, these shadows uh, that, that had scared them before really have no power over them. And, and John, one of the images he's using to describe Jesus in our text is that Jesus is like a light that shines in the darkness and chases all the shadows away. Look at verse 4. It says, in him, that's Jesus, was life. And the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness. And the darkness has not, and I would say cannot, overcome it. And it speaks about John, this man sent from God, John. He came as a witness to bear witness about what? About the light, that all might believe through him. He's not the light, but came witness to bear witness about the light. Verse 9, the true light, that's Jesus, which gives light to everyone who's coming into the world. There are many, uh, many things in this world that promise to give us illumination about ourselves. There are many narratives out there to to help you understand who you are and what your place is in this world, why you're valuable, what's important to you, what's going on in your heart. And many can be helpful to help us understand who we are and what we're like. It may provide some meaningful insight into our emotions and our feelings, insight and relief from anxiety or fear. But there's only one true light. There's only one true light who gives us a true understanding of ourselves, and that's Jesus. Only Jesus and only true understanding of our position as sinners in need of a mercy of a merciful God. And Jesus as the Savior who came to dwell with us will bring lasting, eternal, flourishing self-understanding and joy. 
and give us confidence that, we are, that we're safe. Even when our circumstances and surroundings don't seem so safe. Only the light of Jesus and understanding given by who he is and what he's done is going to help us make sense of this insane world around us and the sane world inside of us. And what John is declaring and what he says John the Baptist came to proclaim is that Jesus is this bright light that shines into the darkness of this world and shines into the darkness of our own hearts and minds. That he reminds us what's true and what's just a fleeting shadow. Our Jewish readers, John's Jewish readers, uh, when they heard this reference would have understood as well in his reference to light a reference to God dwelling with his people to protect and guide them. When Israel was wandering in the wilderness, what did God show up as? He showed up as a, as a pillar of smoke during the day and at night, a pillar of fire. Light throughout Scripture is a picture of God's presence. Moses, when he approaches the bush, what's the bush got on it? Fire. Right? It's the, it's the light of God. It's his presence protecting, speaking to, dwelling with his people. But notice in verse 5, when he describes light, all the rest of this passage is in the past tense. But verse 5, what does he say? He says, the light shines. He changes tense. He's, this, in the Greek, this, this word, the light shines, is actually uh, indicating an ongoing action. It's not just that he showed up once in the past and then removes himself. The light shines, meaning it shines and it keeps shining and it is still shining and is going on shining. See, the light of Jesus wasn't a temporary provision in the wilderness like Israel. It wasn't just to guide them for a season and then depart from them. No, his presence that we have in Jesus Christ is ongoing, continuing, and enduring for us. His light, the light shining of Jesus, the presence of God with his people is true now. It's true a month from now. It's true a year and 10 years and 10,000 years from now. We have the light of the presence of God himself come to dwell with us in Jesus Christ. What a promise. What an incredible gift Jesus has given us in his incarnation. And this fits together with the second picture that John uses in our text in verse 14. He says, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we see his glory. The glory is the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. This word dwell, that he came to dwell among us, it's, it's the same root word as the word tabernacle. Tabernacle. That's the Old Testament. The tabernacle was the tent where God's presence dwelt with his people. John is saying that God became flesh and he tabernacled with us. He came and dwelt with us. He made his home with us. Jesus didn't just rent an Airbnb for the weekend. No, he changed his address. He moved into the neighborhood. His driver's license now says address earth. He came to be with his people, human flesh. And human flesh that Jesus took on, you understand, wasn't temporary. He took on a human flesh that endures now into eternity. And just as we will have human flesh, resurrected human flesh, in the life to come, so Jesus, God himself, has tabernacled with us now and forever in humanity, in human flesh. Wow. What does that mean for the God who made the billions of stars and just that speck and then throughout the rest of the sky took on human flesh to dwell just right here for now? And he took that on for eternity. What a God. And Jesus, he didn't just take on the good parts of human experience, you understand. He took on all the weaknesses too. This word flesh, the Greek sarx, the flesh that he took on, he took on flesh. It's, it's actually kind of a crude word in the original language. There are other words for taking on humanity, for taking on a body. It doesn't use that word. John doesn't use that word. He used a little bit of a, of a crude word in Greek that speaks of the weakness and the frailty and the, the ickiness of humanity that he took on. He didn't just come and get a perfect, glorified, beautiful body. He came on and took on all the frailty, all the weakness, all the the sweaty, grimy, dirtiness of being human. He took on a body like when we were out yesterday moving boxes and our bodies were just soaked with sweat from top to bottom. You don't even want to come near us because we smell so bad. Jesus had that. He had a body that sweat and had body odor. You understand that Jesus took on uh, all the, the, the grittiness of human life, the injustice of human life too. 
He knows uh, for the kids that are still with us. He knows what it's like when a, when a sibling steals your toy and doesn't give it back. And it's unjust, but they're bigger than you, and they're holding you out like this, and you can't do anything about it. He knows what it's like for a neighbor to, to back into your mailbox and not leave a note. Not that that's ever happened to any of us. Or maybe any of us have ever done that. Jesus skinned his knees. He had food poisoning. He knows the grief of loss. He's wept bitter tears at losing someone that he loves so dearly. Jesus took on the fullness of humanity in all its beauty and glory and all of its filthy, icky injustice. The eternal God walked the roads of Jerusalem with sore, dusty feet. And it's in this, in this weakness, in this dependence on the Father, in this incarnation, the, the taking on of the, the fullness of humanity, that John says, in this, verse 14, we have seen the glory of God. Glory is the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. We think of God's glory, we often think of this picture of his splendid majesty, of his robes that fill the temple, of the, of the presence of God that is just thundering and overpowering and, and inapproachable. And certainly that is part of God's glory. But here he says, where we see the fullness of the glory of God is in the frail human body of Jesus Christ is in the weakness and brokenness of a life lived in dependence to the Father. You're going to see throughout the Gospel of John, more than anywhere else, Jesus over and over and over again goes to his Father in prayer and says, I'm dependent. I can't do anything unless the Father gives it to me. The God who made the heavens? Depending on the Father. And that is the glory of God revealed. In his weakness, in his dependence, in his brokenness, in his humanity glory of God is displayed. And so too, in your weakness, in your brokenness, in your dependence on the Father, is the glory of God displayed. It's not just in the resurrected body we receive. Oh yes, that is glory. But here too, in this life, we get to display the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ as we walk through weakness and chronic fatigue and pain and arthritis and death and suffering and loss with joy and hope in the Christ who's risen depending on the Father daily for our needs. We don't have enough for tomorrow, but God's provided for me today. And that is the glory of God revealed. Our church, when we call out to God in our weakness, when we call out to him in our humanity, in our sinfulness, oh, oh, God does not, he did not, he does not turn away in disgust from us, but he does what he did in Christ, what he's always done from the beginning of creation, he draws near. He draws close. He comes to tabernacle with. He just comes to live with us, to dwell with us. Hebrews 14, 15 says, We do not have a great high priest, this is Jesus, who's unable to sympathize with our weakness, but one who in every respect has been tempted, as you have, yet without sin. What's the, what's the implication of that? So what? Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace. It's always been a throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. That's your God, church. We have a Savior who gets it, who gets your weakness. He understands your brokenness. He understands even the temptation to, to hopelessness and to frustration. He, he understands it. Draw near to him. You understand the throne of grace, it's always open 24-7. It's open at 2 a.m. when you're woken up in the night with that treadmill of thoughts, that conversation that didn't go well that you want to go back and rehearse, and you know you could say it better this time, and that time you'll really let them have it. The throne of grace is open. Bring that to the cross. It's, it's open at 2 in the afternoon when the kids are just driving you crazy, and you're ready to just go live under a bridge in Hawaii, and just like, I'm done. Bring it to the cross. The throne of grace is open. God understands Christ has suffered in every way as you have, yet without sin. And he's merciful and open. He says, draw near to me with confidence. Your eternal God, he took on flesh to dwell with you. Eternal God, he took on flesh, point three, to 
give new life. To give new life. John has structured this introduction to his, to his gospel in a very Hebrew way. It's, it's kind of like a grace sandwich. Uh, if you look carefully, you can go back and study this. Uh, there are parallels all the way through the text. The beginning matches the end, and the inside matches the side inside of that. And right in the very middle of this text is what uh, is most important to the author, what he says as his big idea. And that's this. That Jesus came that all who believe in him might have eternal life. Look with me at verse 10. He was in the world. The world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. Verse 11, he came to his own. His own people did not receive him. And then verse 12, this is right at the middle. But all who did receive him, who believed on his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Born not of flesh, born not of blood, nor of the will of flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. John speaks about the deep tragedy of the incarnation. The deep tragedy of the God who gave birth to the world, the God who created all things, who earth was his home, he made it, <laughs> he designed it for himself, comes to his home, comes to his place, comes to his people, and they reject him. They ignore him. They murder him. In the first 12 chapters, the first half of the book of John, we see this played out time and again and again and again. Jesus comes to his people and he's rejected. He comes to his, the temple and he's mocked. He's, his family makes fun of him. They, they send him out. His friends, his community, his own people, his own tribe, all of them, nobody listens. And yet, Jesus would not be stopped his mission would not be deterred. He would continue pursuing his people, pursuing his creation, tabernacling, coming close, making his home with them until he has a people of his own for his own possession. Until verse 12, all who did receive him, believe in his name, he came the right to become children of God. This word believe, it's a big word in John. Believe is a huge word in John. He uses it almost a hundred times in his gospel. That's almost three times more than all other three gospels put together. John wants you to believe. He wants you to believe what Jesus says about himself, who Jesus says he is, and what he says he's done. And for John to believe isn't just a mental assent. It's, it's trust in the context of relationship. It's to entrust yourself fully and finally to the finished work of Jesus, to acknowledge him as the eternal God who came in the flesh to save you from your sins. You don't see this as much in the English, but believe here is a, is a participle. It's, it's an ongoing. It says, to all who were believing, who were believing in the name of God, meaning it's, it's an ongoing activity. When we believe in the name of Jesus, it's not just that you went up one day to an altar and said, I believe, I prayed the prayer, and then I go home and nothing changes. No, to believe is to live a life of intimacy with the God who made you. It's a transition of life. It's a transition of trust from self to God. Believing in the name of Jesus is the central activity of the Christian life. It's not going to church or doing your best to stop doing bad sins. Those are good things, but those are products, not the core. At the core of the Christian life is, is believing in the name of Jesus. It's falling time and again and again upon the mercy of God and saying, this is my hope. This is my grace. This is what gives me identity. This is what gives me purpose in life is that I'm a sinner saved by the blood of Jesus. To go to Christ again and again is the source of our joy, of our purpose, of our hope, of our meaning in life. And what does Jesus give us? <laughs> what does he give to those who believe on his name? Verse 12, the right to become children of God. Wow. That's an incredible thing to be said. We would become children of the God who made the stars, the God who made all of creation, that those who believe in his name go from enemies to children, to be welcomed as sons and daughters of the God who they hated, the God who they rejected, the God who they ran from. Not only will he dwell with us, but he'll make us his own family and his own children. This is an incredible promise, and it's a promise for today. We get to be his children now, and it's a promise for eternity. 
We get to remain his children all through the ages and ages come. Church, you understand our identity in this life and our identity in the, in the life to come is not in our tribe here. It's not in our affiliation with a political party. It's not in our, our, our circles that we run in, the, the, uh, the things that we do to, 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 to give us fun, the vocations we're a part of, or our hobbies. Our eternal identity is not rooted in these temporary things. Our eternal identity is rooted in Christ and his identification of us as sons and daughters of the living God. That's our hope. That's our family. That's our identity. And the church now is just a little taste of what we're going to have in eternity, of all tribes, all nations, all peoples coming together to be the people of God. I don't know what kind of family you grew up with. Um, you may have grown up with your, you know, a family straight out of like a 1950s sitcom. Do they even have TVs in 1950? I don't know. I don't, I'll, do they? I, you, yes. a, okay. Is the black and white with the bunny ears? Okay. You had to walk up and, Okay. Uh, maybe you grew up with, a, a, with two loving, caring parents in a, a family where, you know, casserole was on the table every day at 5.30 and everything was, was wonderful. Most likely you grew up with some brokenness in your family. Maybe that brokenness was severe. Maybe you had parents who, who weren't there. Or it'd be, it would have been better if they weren't there. But Jesus is promising us, promises us here to all who believe in his name, that those who believe in his name are given a new family, we're given a new lineage, we're given a new father, a father uncorrupted by the fall, a father uncorrupted by sin, a father who treasures and loves us so deeply that he sent his own son to take on human flesh to die that you might have life. A father who, far from abusing his children or taking advantage or manipulating his children, a father who took on the abuse himself that we deserved, that we might become his children. Oh, what a gift. What a promise. Church, God has made a way for us to find our chief, our primary, our core identity in him and what he has done for us in his unchanging, eternal mercy and grace poured out for you now and forever. And this offer, it's, it's, it's not because we were good enough. He doesn't offer to adopt us because we were the cutest kid in the orphanage. It says, those who were born not of blood, nor the will of flesh, nor the will of man, but born by who? Of God. Of God. So all ways of saying flesh gives birth to flesh, flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit is what gives birth to the spiritual our spiritual new life, our identity as children of the living God doesn't hinge upon our obedience. It doesn't hinge upon human works, upon human obedience, upon human will. No, it hinges on what Christ has done, on God's work, on his will, on his obedience, on his eternal faithfulness and love and mercy. Only our spiritual father, only a spiritual father can give eternal spiritual life. And he has done just that for us. And look who it's for. Verse 12, he says, to all who did receive him, to all, not to some, not to a few, not to the best of those who receive him, he said, to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become sons of God. Oh, that's beautiful. It's not just those who clean up their life first, not just those who are free from addiction, those who no longer participate in sin, no, those who receive him become children of God. And maybe you're here this morning and, and there's something stirring in you. You want to be a son of the living God. You want to be a daughter of the living God. You want to find your identity in something transcendent, something that's not changing from this day to the next day, something that doesn't depend on your perfect obedience or works, you living out your identity perfectly. Your identity can be and ought to be and is offered to you to be rooted in the God who made you now and for eternity. And it's a free gift. And even the stirring of your heart, if you have a desire this morning, you want to know God, it means God has already started to tabernacle with you. He's already come close to you. He's already drawing near to you. You wouldn't have that desire if he wasn't drawing near already this morning. Oh, would you trust in Jesus today? There's no magic ceremony. Give him your life. Say, God, I want you. <laughs> and he will draw near to you as he already has begun. 
Oh, church, what a gift. You're in Christ this morning. Let us hold fast to our hope. Hold fast to the confidence. Let us believe. Let us continue to believe that the eternal God took on flesh and has given us new life. I believe this eternal God who has always been merciful from the beginning of creation, who came to dwell with us permanently, to tabernacle and live with us, and offers the free gift of eternal new birth as children of the living God. Amen? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we just, we just say thank you this morning. You are a magnificent, wonderful, amazing God. It is remarkable that we even get to speak to you this morning, that we get to hear from you. It is remarkable that the God who made the heavens, who made all the billions of trillions of stars in the universe would care to speak with us, would care to listen to us. And yet you do, Lord. You've given us your very word to tell us about yourself, to reveal yourself to us this morning. Lord, I pray that you would give us eyes to see you in your beauty, eyes to see you in your glory, eyes to see you in your magnificent power, and also eyes to see you, Lord Jesus, in your, your tabernacling with us, your dwelling among us, your participation in the broken humanity that you took on on the cross, on your birth, and in your perfect life. Lord, I pray this morning that you would free up our hearts, Lord God, to, to have courage to approach the throne of grace with confidence this morning. Lord, if there are there, there, those here this morning who um, have burdens that they've been carrying on their own, weights that they have felt just weighing down their shoulders as they walk through their day, uh, Lord, I pray that this morning they would bring those burdens to your cross, to the throne of grace, the throne that has been merciful since the beginning of time and will be until time is long gone. Would they, Lord God, take those burdens and lay them at the feet of your merciful throne, Lord God, and receive freedom and life and joy and hope in the name of Jesus Christ. Lord, teach us to trust you, to depend on you, and to delight in you and you alone this morning, Lord Jesus. Lord, thank you that we have a promise that this life is not the end, that we have a life to come, that we have a Savior who is returning, who has come to dwell with us and continues to dwell with us and will in that day build a new place for us to dwell together with you without any <laughs> barrier between us for all of eternity. Lord, I pray that we would live for that day, hope in that day, and delight in that day, Lord Jesus.